Hello and welcome to the deck tech of this week's tournament. I decided to switch over from Gauntlets since they are honestly a little bit of a low power level and you don't play against the best people most of the time to playing in the Legends of Terror Discord tournaments. And this is the subreddit Legends of Terror Discord. I will leave a link to it in the description. And they do weekly tournaments with different formats. And as you can see right here, under the event news, you can see in this week's format. And it is a, a three deck, one ban, best of three conquest. So basically gauntlet mode, you bring three decks and one gets banned. And then we have a lineup restriction, which is heavy hitter and riot lock. So heavy hitter says spells that cost zero to three mana are not allowed. Only four plus mana are allowed. Units and landmarks that cost zero or two mana are not allowed. Only three plus mana are allowed. So basically no cheap spells, no gluttony, no flash freeze, nothing like that. And no cheap units. So both champions like Fizz or Timo are not allowed. Or landmarks, I guess. Not really that many cheap landmarks. But basically you have to build a deck that's a little bit more on the expensive side. And the same with the gauntlet, no duplicate champions, region combinations, more than one deck without champions at all. So as explained down here, this is the same as the gauntlet rules. And you can participate just by signing up and basically um, reacting to one of these bots here. It's really, really easy. And then you get invited to this EU tournaments channel. And it's basically very self-explanatory. The host, Vainsense, is I hope you pronounce this correctly, it's very awesome and it's very helpful, even like this was my second tournament I participated in and it's just always a lot of fun. As you can see, there are nine people today, or less today technically, but yeah, it's always a lot of fun and I can just recommend you participating from the power level or level of players. Most I would say are masters or at least play on the masters level, but even if you're like platinum or diamond, you can definitely participate. If you are below that, you can of course also participate, but I wouldn't expect to necessarily go first place immediately. In this video, I want to talk about how I approached this deck building constrictions and how I built my decks to the format. I didn't really invest too much time into it. It was more of a spontaneous decision on Sunday, like the start on Sunday, um, 6 p.m. on my time. And at 4 p.m. I was like, Maybe I don't want to record the gauntlet. Let's just see if the tournament is something interesting. And then I spent like 20 to 25 minutes building the decks. So they're not like super refined or anything. But I still want to explain to you my approach to this format. Let's switch over to the client. And as you can see here, you see my three decks already. But let's start with the cards. And first you have to think about what will the meta be? What is the most obvious strategy? to do if you can't play any cheap units, if you can't play any cheap spells. And for me, the obvious thing to do would have been the Chase Lux deck. Uh, can't type, unfortunately. So with Chase, you have the six cost spells. So Chase and Lux usually want to build the expensive stuff anyways. And want to just have the six cost spells, you will have three mana, three spell mana. So cast casting a remembrance on turn three is probably the most strongest thing you can do, like with three normal mana, three spell mana. Let me get this out of the way. I already got the last chance gauntlet. Not, not, no, but it's still flashing. Okay, but basically I expected Lux Chase to be one of the main decks. Second main deck I expected would be Targon, well, not a Targon card, Targon's Peak Landmark, which reduces the cost of all random cards in the hand to zero. Then you just put in like ramp, the voices of the old ones, just the gigantic ramp cards, and then like Aurelian Soul, and basically all the cards that say I win the game. And the third one was just if you made things like late game, everybody will imagine Anivia for example, and will bring Anivia decks because she's like the ultimate late game enlightened and just try to build a control deck with a ton of vengeances or denies just all of the expensive spells and deny of course also a card that probably everybody will think about bringing because if every spell you can counter is costing four or more then this deny is just very very powerful because you don't just have cheap spells 
and you can only put so many expensive units into the deck. Now, if you th think about the Chase and Aurelian Soul, what is Chase and Lux weak against? And it's mostly weak against, I would say, combo decks. So stuff like Tunnel the Thunder Control or the Bandle Tree. And immediately I came, I wanted to have, I had the idea to make the Bandle Tree work. And this landmark, if you followed the series, is one I always like playing. I played it in the first gauntlet, but it seems pretty hard to make it work because in the normal Bandle Tree deck, you can also take a look at this, normal Bandle Tree deck has a lot of small cost units. So you have the Loping Telescope, House Spider, Gumbel's Luck, Bomber Twins, Rotoporo, Cannon. All of those serve an important role to complete the Bandle Tree. You have the Freljord, Ionia, Shurima, Bilgewater, uh, Noxus, Shadow Isles, Pargon, and this is just a big hole you have to fill. However, we don't really have to be in Noxus anymore. If you look at what cards in Noxus we play, Ravenous Flock, House Spider, Arachnid Sentry, and Scorched Earth, I immediately saw that like, we can't play any of those, so there's no really reason to be in Noxus anymore. So, starting from this Bandle Tree idea, I came up with this deck. Let's just start with this one. And it, of course, has the Bandle Tree in it as a... By the way, I didn't mention it yet, but all of these are open deck list formats, so your opponent gets to see your deck, and you get to see your opponent's deck. So in the games, you will actually see the opponent's deck list at the start. And this is why I will explain some of the decisions I made in this deck list. Again, it's not super refined or anything. I just threw it together in like seven or eight minutes, but it's still hopefully interesting to listen to how it went. So Bandle Tree wants you to summon units from 10 different regions. And the region that's kind of bad for Shurima is like you have the Hothead you can play. Normally you just play the Bomber Twins. Hothead would be an okay play on three. However, I decided that it would be a pretty cool line against people who, for example, bring Anivia, who bring the Howling Abyss decks. Like that's also something I expected, just bring people bringing like gigantic value decks. And then Talia allows you to copy your Bandle Tree and basically we have two panel trees and from that point on it will be super easy to complete because you just get two followers per turn and can really churn out. So that means we have Talia and Shurima already. I also add in two Shurima cards. The Mercedes Hunter first of all, just a very good overall unit, turns on turn three and can immediately deal, deal damage and also deal with early threats for example. And then I also added in Desert Naturalist because destroying a landmark is very valuable in this format. Of course, opponents can also think about playing tree. Seems like a pretty obvious thing to do. Or they can bring the Targon's Peak, as we talked about before. And being able to blow up the Targon's Peak on turn four seemed very valuable. That's why I decided to run the two of Desert Naturalist. And because we want to have a second target for Desert Naturalist and just another target for Talia to copy with landmarks, I also ran a three of a Garon Wacker Bond. This card summons this Wallet's Palace, and if it ever flips, you get to predict the raw one, so just decent value, decent three drop. Maybe I would have switched the numbers a little bit right now. But as naturalist, definitely one of my tech decisions. I wanted to be able to destroy the, the Targon's Peak, destroy any landmark based deck, Howling Abyss, etc., all of the value stuff. And then, but look at the other cards. Of course, Banner City Mayor, the key card for any multi region deck. You just have to bring this card if you want to play the multi-region bandle deck. Babbling Maladiers is my source for Ionia. There might be better sources rather than sources for Ionia, but I just like also being able to drop two units for cheap, because just a three and a one is decent, just a two of. Aloof Traveler is of course insane, brings PNC and also discards some high-end stuff from the opponent's hand. Two of Hoppy. So this two of is by the way pretty standard for bandle tree lists. They run two of, of the cards you actually want and then some interaction. So Poppy, just typical. You don't really have that many small units, but still, it's the best Demasi we can get. And then we have Rumble. I thought Rumble would be pretty strong because, of course, you can't just like easily pop the Spell Shield. Spell Shield in general is something I'm going for in this run. And then just going down on turn four and makes him flip pretty fast. Didn't turn out that well as I thought, but it's still our Noxus one. Like Rumble didn't really have that much impact because he didn't have any overwhelm and stuff like that. But yeah, still okay, I would say. And then Talia is our champions. 
Fan of Terror for Shadow Eyes, we have a decent amount of card generation with the Mayor, Balladeers, etc. I also brought some Veil of Judgment. I expected people to bring expensive followers of some kind, whether it be like from the Remembrance we talked about before. Remembrance can just summon, for example, a Mountain Drake. This guy over here, a 0 6, which has formidable, so basically a 6 6. And if you summon a 6 6 on turn 3, you can just Veil of Judgment it and destroy it. Same with like a Screeching Dragon. It can also be summoned, or the Great Horn. So just all of these Remembrance cards can be killed with Veil of Judgment. And in a pinch, you can also deal 2 to a champion. If somebody brings like a Leblanc, for example. Yeah, it's just like a decent removal spell, I would say. Then Poro Sled is a 3 off. Poro Sled is amazing in, in Bandle 3 because it summons a random Poro and this random Poro counts towards your tree progression. That's why I run it as a 3 off. Also, our Freljord. And this is also why I don't want to run Gna in this deck. Like, it seems really obvious that you want to put Gna in. That's the best Bandle City champion right now. However, if you put him in, then you have an overlap with Freljord. So I decided to not bring Gna, instead, bring Rumble and Poppy. And of course, Bandle Tree. The next few cards are a little interesting. Many more of is pretty obvious self explanatory. Everybody plays big stuff. Many more of is pretty good. And yeah, then I brought the Yordle Contraption, which might be surprising, but gives you multi vision followers and most importantly destroys a landmark. And again, this deck is really geared towards dealing with Targon's Peak, dealing with another Bandit Tree deck. Just having the four sources of destroy a landmark in your deck, Death Naturalist and Yordle Contraption, is Pretty powerful in my opinion, and in the worst case, you just play it on whatever and get some more followers in your hand. Because this deck can run out of value if they have some way to deal with three, and you want to have a way to refuel. Then you also have the one of Shark Trainer with the Bilgewater, and then I played one of Chrono Shift. This is more of a kind of card that will change my opponent's play because they always have to think about this card existing in my deck. I don't really want to play it, oftentimes, it's just a one off. But this is really powerful in open decklist formats that you put one card in that your opponent is like, hmm, that's weird, I have to remember that. And whenever they go to try and kill my Rumble, whenever they go and try to kill my Poppy, they are like, in the back of their head, they think, aha, Chrono Shift, does that exist? I have to play around it. And I usually like to include one or two cards like this in this deck. And in a slower format, Chrono Shift is not terrible. Like, it's not amazing, but it's also not terrible, it's just a one-off. Then I decided to run a one-off Bilgewater card, the Shark Trainer. And the treasure trash just for the big random cards that I run out of stuff. Never drew either of those cards in these games, sadly. But yeah, this was the first deck. Also, two right of negation, just pretty powerful. If I could go back, I would run three. I was a little bit afraid of killing allies or destroying mana champs, that this would be too punishing. But whenever I had it, it was just so amazing against these six cost spells, like a shock blast, for example. This guy and was just so, so good at taking down any of the expensive spells. So deck one, the Bandle City deck, and let's take a look at the second deck, because my second deck was just, when my opponent is bringing a lot of value, I just want to bring more value. And one of my favorite combinations that was stolen later on by other people is Seb's Bravefin, my Great Mother. And the usual downside with, like, my Mary Grandmother puts these six cost spells in the deck that costs three, and Seb's Bravefin draws a spell that costs three or less from your deck. So basically, you can shuffle all of these six cost spells in your deck and then draw them with Seb's Bravefin. Normally, the downside is that you can't play any other three or lower spells, but in this format, you can't even play any other three or lower cost spells. So there is basically no downside. Now we don't want to just have this combo, we want to have other ways to draw our 6 cost spells. So I included a River Shaper, Strike Drawer spell, and Deep Meditation, just moving into Ionia, just drawing more spells. And if you have a lot of ways to draw spells, we don't want to run out of uh, spells. So I included the Lost Riches, which puts in these treasures. And should maybe hover it a little bit more so you can read it. And the Shipwreck Hoarder. So just the treasures as well. And then we have some more card draw in our deck with the Salvage, Shadow Assassin. And a big problem with this deck, I don't actually like how this worked out in the end, was that I have too much value. You might say, what does it mean, too much value? I often had too many cards in the hand. For example, had multiple copies of the Treasure Trove, which just did nothing, because I couldn't create 500 cards because my hand was full. So definitely, I think this one is the weakest deck I made. I would definitely throw it a little bit around, make 
more cards or add more cards in that can just be played on their own. For example, the um, I don't know how it's called. This guy, is it this guy would have added in just the just pair the unit and summon two units. This seemed very strong and just cut down on some of the value. That was a little bit too greedy. Let's go with the other cards. Troll Hunter is just amazing. And just the Challenger unit interaction and the Targon decks, for example, run the how's it called? Do like this. No. Um extra mana. This guy, Wording Stones. And you can just, if they play it on turn 3, you have the attack token, which just play out the troll hunters and destroy the building stones immediately. Then you get to ramp. And it's just overall a strong card. Gets with the random sea monster in hand. Shadow Assassin just replaces itself, draws a card. Triple deny should be obvious. Everybody plays big spells. Then deny is amazing. For the second champion, I thought about it a little bit. I first had Lux in there with like Demacia. And. And switch to Karma. Karma just seems like the best option with the double spells. If your opponent goes to 10 mana, they do this crazy Radiant Souls stuff. You can go over the top with them. Like, I legitimately killed like two Radiant Souls one game. And it was crazy. And Karma is just the ultimate late game card in Legends of Terror. And if you can go Karma into double up on any amazing spell, like double up on the Blade Mac, for example, that just usually wins you the game. And then I just added in more value, like Twisted Fate is over very good, like the red card is not really doing anything here, but the gold card is quite strong, just a stun for one important turn, and also you can draw your card, and I also added in an Abyssal Eye, this guy was definitely overkill, not sure what I would have added otherwise, but we don't, didn't really need the card to draw ever, and then I added in two sunk costs, Again, one of the decks I expect is Bandle Tree, and just having the answer for Bandle Tree for one turn is quite good. However, what I didn't think about was that Bandle Tree runs the Aloof Travelers, and they can just discard my sunk cost, but that's just the Bilgewater life, because you, as Bilgewater and Ionia, you just have no way to deal with the Bandle Tree effectively. But we played sunk cost, and we made it kind of work. So yeah, this was the second deck. Basically, my Rai Great Mother and Seb Sprayfin with a bunch of random spells, random card draw. And the third one I'm really proud of, it also got undefeated because let's go back to the card menu for a moment and think about what, what opponents are going to play. They're either going to play this slow late game stuff with the Targon's Peak, as we talked about, slow late game and they like on turn 7, 8, 9 and start winning. Or they play Vengeances and just try to kill everything. Or they play um, the Lux and stuff with the Shock Blast, for example. So just the double damage and just play the removal spell, double it up with Chase. And I thought, how can we be as unfun, as uninteractive as possible? And one of the most unfun, uninteractive combos to play against is this deck, which finally features my favorite card, probably it's Destiny's Call. And let me read this card, 8 mana burst, Grand Ally in hand, plus 8, plus 8. And the funny thing is, if you put this on a attune card, the attached unit gets the bonus, but even if they kill the, the original unit, the attached unit keeps the bonus. So this turns into a 10-9, turns the unit into a 10-9 elusive, and when they kill the original unit, the rainbow fish, comes, rainbow fish comes back to hand. And the only way to really circumvent this is by obliterating. So in this format, like normally you have to obliterate with the three sisters. And it's generally just too slow. So three sisters over here. And this one generates the entomb. And then you obliterate the attached unit with the other. I should like show it more. You obliterate the original unit and the attached unit also gets obliterated. But in this format, the only way is like invoking. So if you have like a fallen combat, for example. Um, this guy, fallen combat, or a supernova, obliterate units. These can only come from Invoke, of course. And otherwise, you have no real way of obliterating. I guess the next one is Buried in Ice. Uh, that's just a 9 mana spell, and until that comes online, uh, that's taking a lot of time, basically. And most importantly, those are all very slow, very expensive spells. And what gets, what blocks spells? Right, Spell Shield, as you probably have spotted already. This is just the biggest. I have a big Spell Shield unit and I put a Rainbow Fish on it deck possible. Most uninteractive, unfun, 
had a good build. And it runs very cool card and made it prismatic just for this occasion. The fledgling stellar corn, very good in this deck. Lifesteal and spell shield means it basically has a spell shield already, so they have to use one spell already. And remember, they don't have any cheap spells. They can't, like Misty Shot, can't Pokey Stick. They have to use a spell that costs four more on breaking the spell shield. So, Fletcher Stellar Corn, very, very good. Also, Lifesteal. I would say Stellar Corn is even better than Sparklefly, because we usually want to have the Rainbow Fish. And Sparklefly doesn't have spell shield, it has Elusive instead. And yeah, for the uh, combo Destiny's Call, we have three attached units, possibly Yumi is the weakest one. In this deck, we just want to run Yumi out as a normal card on three. And then put the Rainbow Fish on her. Or we just don't want to play her. Then we have the Rainbow Fish, this is our main combo. Just on turn, then we bank the mana, then on turn 5 we play Destiny's Call on a Rainbow Fish, and then on turn 6 we can play a Rainbow Fish or wait a turn and hold off Bastion Friendship, for example. But yeah, Rainbow Fish, pretty strong. And then the last one, Papercraft Dragon with the double attack, also a reasonable choice, and mostly works with our elusives, like with our Sparklefly. Then I added a Gleaming Lantern, just another 3-drop, and reduces all of our attached cards. So if you have Gleaming Lantern on the board, we can on turn 6 play Rainbow Fish for 2 mana, and still hold up our Bastion and Friendship, so very powerful. And just wanted to have more 3-drops. Aloof Terrorless, just a general get wrecked card, helps us draw, gets a, removes our opponent's expensive card, for example Buried in Ice, costs 9 mana if they have that. It might be discarded by Aloof Terrorless. Then you have all of the Space Shield, I didn't want to go 6-6, six, six because I felt like it was a little bit too many spells, but probably in hindsight I should have. The Bastion granting spell shield and Friendship granting spell shield or barrier, very powerful. And for the champion I wasn't really sure, I just settled on Pantheon because he has Overwhelm already. And Taric, was, I probably will switch it around now, Taric 2 and Pantheon 1. It's kind of iffy, those are probably the worst cards in the deck. Maybe we should just cut them and add in some more unattractiveness, but I guess the next if you look at spell shield. Next best special unit to run would be like a Climber or a Firebrand, and I think the Pantheon is just a little bit stronger there with the Overwhelm coming in. And then I just ran two Star Shaping, Star Shaping combos with Taric. So if you put Star Shaping on Taric, he copies the Star Shaping, gets you invoked twice, and also just heals you a little bit. And then again, tacking for the Remembrance. If they turn six or turn three Remembrance me, I want to answer this unit, so I have Triple Sunburst. Or roll just a decent card and triple mini morph. And those are the three decks we bring. You can also watch the first game in the after afterwards. I hope you enjoy this run. Tell me in the comments if you like this. Like this is definitely more, I would say, more competitive than the Gauntlet series because Gauntlet just everybody plays anything. And this one we mostly play against Masters players with an interesting format decision. So tell me if you like it or if you would prefer me like doing just normal. Lettering stuff with the meta decks, for example. And yeah, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and maybe we will meet each other in the next Air Lore tournament on next Sunday. See you.